when you're looking at most athletic shoes, it's like this big chunky cushion heel. And then it comes to like this downward slope. And then you're in a little narrow toe box. Like yeah. why did this even happen? And like, what is that doing essentially? <laughs> like whose idea was that? And then yeah, like, so what, is, what is it doing to our gait? And like, is it yeah. even good for running? Like, do we need a chunky shoe for running? If you, if we balance barefoot with our connection to the ground, it's a whole lot easier than balancing on a cushion, like one of like a BOSU ball, basically. Mm -hmm. Like our foot is meant to be giving us this feedback to our brain as to where we are in space, as to where we are in our environment, whether we should be going fast, slow, long step, short steps. Um, so our feet are meant to be giving us this feedback and to put a big cushion on them is like putting, um, it's like putting a blindfold on to protect your eyes from the sun rather than sunglasses. Yeah. So if you just put sunglasses, yeah. sunglasses, it would be just like a thin leather sole or thin rubber sole that protects your foot from something sharp. Um, whereas the big cushioning is like putting that blindfold on your eyes. So. Hey sister, welcome back to the Daily Mom Trip Podcast. I am your host, Jesse Trulove, and today's podcast is all about the feet. If you have worked out with me before, you know how passionate I am about the feet as our foundation. You can always find me in my workouts barefoot or wearing my barefoot shoes by Feel Grounds. Today I am joined by podiatrist Andy Bryant with over 20 years of experience. He has seen his fair share of feet. We are gonna chat through the importance of being barefoot, myths about bunions, flat and high arched feet, orthotics, baby feet and shoes and more. Going barefoot doesn't have to be overnight, but rather one step at a time. I love this conversation and I hope you do too. If you find it helpful, be sure to share the podcast and leave a review. With that said, let's dive into the show. All right, Andy, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I'm super stoked to have you. Can you go ahead and just kick us off with introducing yourself a little bit about your education, what you're doing now, and um, just a little bit of your background? Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a podiatrist in Melbourne here in Australia, and um, podiatrists are a little different in Australia. We're more like a PT. We're not so much um, medically based. Or it's still like an what they call it allied health, but we haven't done um, doctor school, you know, like the um, podiatrists in the States. So um, that's been like 23 years now. And oh, wow. so I finished school, just normal high school and stuff and went to university and studied podiatry and it was just like run of the mill, normal podiatry for many years. But then um, I think it was a, a strong yoga practice got me thinking about strengthening the feet. And then I just started to think I should be doing this for my clients. It's a different way compared to um, what traditional podiatry does, which is more about supportive things. Mm -hmm. And so I'd been in a big practice and making orthotics and just doing all routine things. And then I've just gone out on my own over the last two or three years. I've got a really busy practice here in Melbourne that's based around um, people strengthening or rehabilitating their feet like you would any other part of the body. So like mm -hmm. we might um, rehabilitate the shoulder or the neck or the back by movement, movement and um, strength. And that's what I try and do with the feet as well. Okay. And when you have people coming in, do they come in with other issues? Like, like, do they come in with a knee problem and then you also look at the knee or do they only, you only do feet? Um, they might come in with a knee problem, not to me as first port of call. They might've seen their physio, like their PT, mm -hmm. um, like physical therapist or their GP and, and that other health professionals flagged that the feet might be part of the issue okay. or they may have a whole lot of issues and they're thinking that their feet as the basis of what we're standing on, obviously are having some effect, but it's a bit chicken or egg or top down, bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to know whether like a lot of the time, a lot of us are sitting a lot. So our hips aren't as functional as they should be. And our hips are really the driver of what's going on at the feet. And so um, I can usually assess as to whether it's more of a foot issue or more of a hip issue and the knees in between and um yes when we change what's going on at the foot it affects further up the stream but also when we change what's going upstream it mm -hmm. affects the foot as well right so Probably you're saying like the, yeah oh yeah so the longer i do what i do the more i understand yeah. that the entire body is completely interconnected and it, yeah. it that chicken and the egg is like a great way to describe it um you know so I help a lot of women in the postpartum and prenatal population. And a yeah. lot of it has to do with pelvic floor dysfunction and core dysfunction, like diastasis. And I have a huge fascination with the feet and I always work out barefoot. And it's kind of like the last thing on people's mind when they want to correct, um, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction or leaking or being able to connect to their pelvic floor. But like you said, the hips can be a big driver for the feet and also from the feet up, you know, if we don't have great foot support, that's going to impact the way our knee is curving in or curving out. And then that's going to impact our pelvic positioning and it all just affects each other, which I just think is a great way to put it because it's totally true. Um, yeah. 
And, so, and just, on that, just on that, when we use the big toe properly, then we mm -hmm. um, it light, light up the, and we gave up the ability to um, have an opposing um, digit. So your thumb compared to your fingers is opposing, whereas the big toe is working the same way as the rest of the toes. But we gave up the ability to have an opposing digit there so we could stand up straight. And this big toe is like the critical factor with the foot. And when we use that properly, it um, is good for the inside of our foot, the inside of our legs, our inside of our um, thighs into our pelvic floor. Yeah. And so we see um, most shoes are pushing that big toe out of alignment or out of um, proper use. And so you, you're missing that connection. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, one thing I noticed because I used to wear, I used to love Nike shoes and not yeah. to like call out Nike, but Nikes are like extremely narrow or like Converse shoes are very narrow. And you end up walking more on the bony joint of your foot. And so like, what would be, I guess for people to, to kind of feel this for themselves, like when you're walking, you lose touch with that big toe. You're not pushing off the toe. You end up pushing off that joint. Or, or you end up pushing, or sometimes you end up pushing off. Like a lot of people end up pushing off through the second and third um, mm -hmm. toes rather than through the straight off through the big toe, or we push off sideways through the big toe. Like you go one way or the other way, but you're definitely not using that big toe as the hinge that it's meant to be, like a, a nice perfect hinge. Yeah. So, is is it important for everybody to be going barefoot? Like what? Like should if you, our kids are like barefoot all the time? Like for me and my family, we are barefoot all the time. But why is it so important from like an early childhood? perspective like for kids to be barefoot like should we be putting the cute little shoes on our kids like when they're teeny tiny or should we yeah. ditch the shoes are they practical or, or so not? here in Australia we have what's called a child health care maternal child health care nurse and this is someone you go and check in with like every week to start with when you've just had your baby and then every month and then every six months and so that's your first port of call and they are very well um well educated to that when a child first starts walking that they should be, if they're in a shoe, they should be in a wide, thin, flat and flexible shoe, a, a very, just protection from sharp things, hot and cold. Mm -hmm. So, And that's the, like the given, like if you ask any podiatrist or any um, pediatrician, like they'll all say that that's what a child should be in when they first start walking. But then we get the child to two or three and they go off to kindergarten or play school or whatever. Um, and, and there they are in their little Nikes and their little Asics, their little good shoes, you know, what we call the good shoes, the support, the cushioning, Mm -hmm. as though their foot is already developed the reasoning behind that first baby shoe is so that they can develop their foot strength and their proprioception and their balance and then we think oh that's already done by the time they're two or three and now we need this supportive shoe really my passion is about not having anyone in that supportive shoe ever because then we would just be wiping out so many foot conditions and so many foot complaints yeah. because the foot is designed to be in that wide flat, flexible shoe, or if, if, if in any shoe, it should be just something that is protecting the foot rather than cushioning it, putting you on a heel, squishing your toes. And, and so um, I know I see it here. Once the kids turn three, they're all in these good shoes, supportive. And really that message doesn't change. I have 70, 80 year old clients that change back to a minimal shoe, like a baby shoe, basically. And yeah. their feet get stronger, their balance gets better. So mm -hmm. um, it's never too late. And um, it's just the older you get, the harder it is to get used to it and to change, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Well, yeah, like because you, you've been relying on this big cushy thing, yeah. you know, this pillow foot, then relying on your muscles and then, yeah, to switch that. It, yeah. And proprioceptive wife, wise, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like when you're looking at most athletic shoes, it's like this big chunky cushion heel and then it comes to like this downward slope and then you're in a little narrow toe box. Like yeah. why did this even happen? And like, what is that doing essentially? Like whose idea was that? And then yeah, like, so what, is, what is it doing to our gait? And like, is it yeah. even good for running? Like, do we need a chunky shoe for running or? Yeah. yeah. So I've got the, so I can explain that really well. Um, firstly, um, when we've got 20,000 nerve receptors on the sole of our feet. So this um, idea that they're part of our sensory system. So when you're balancing, if you close your eyes, it's really hard to balance. Um, if you shut your ears, it changes the way you balance. Um, if you if we balance barefoot with our connection to the ground, it's a whole lot easier than balancing it on a cushion like one like a Bosu ball, basically. Mm -hmm. Like our foot is meant to be giving us this feedback to our brain as to where we are in space, as to where we are in our environment, whether we should be going fast, slow, long steps, short steps. Um, so our feet are meant to be giving us this feedback. And to put a big cushion on them is like putting um it's like putting a blindfold on to protect your eyes from the sun rather than sunglasses. Yeah. So if you just put sunglasses, yeah. sunglasses it would be just like a thin leather sole or thin rubber sole that protects your foot from something sharp. Um, whereas the big cushioning is like putting that blindfold on your eyes. So it's really overkill. 
Mm -hmm. How it came about, though, is that, say, in the 50s, maybe 1950s, there was a, um, uh, the athletic shoe of the time was something wide. It wasn't that wide, actually, but it was thin and flexible. It was just like this loafer, and that's what um, athletes would run around the track in, and that's what, like, if you watched a basketball game in the 50s, they'd be in their Chuck Taylors, you know, a Converse Chuck Taylors, which was thin. It was flexible. It was flat. It didn't have cushioning. Um, It was a bit tapered at the toe. But that was the athletic shoe of the time. But then in the 60s, there was a big running boom. So a whole lot of sedentary people became runners, you know. And so running is a skill in itself. And if you've been yeah. sitting at your desk all day and or, or walking around in a heeled business shoe and then you go for a run, your body's not really equipped to run well. And so people were getting injured, especially mm-hmm. because they were running in a shoe that was so flexible and flat. And so the running companies that were booming, just starting at the time, this is like your Adidas, your Puma, your Nike, or, you know, all these big brands were like, okay, we need to stop people getting injured. And so they went to orthopedic surgeons said, how do we stop people getting injured? And they're like, you've got to put a heel lift in because these people are used to wearing heels all the time. Um, a running technique should be your foot landing closer to under your body rather than really overstriding. As soon as you put this big cushion on, we become, it's so much easier to overstride and put your foot out in front of you. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of good because a whole lot of people could run without injuries for a short time. Right. But maybe we should have been teaching them to run better in the first place or going, right. okay, let's, you know, let's look at the fact that you're sitting all day. And I guess this has happened now, like the standing desks and people are conscious of wearing a heel. But in those days, that was a given. You're going to sit all day and then go for your run to do your exercise right. as opposed to just being like a mover. And so um, these, this is where the big shoe came, boom came. This shoe that's healed, like you mentioned, and tapered, tapered to the toe and tapered in both ways, like as in on a ramp, um, came about out of the running out of the running boom. But now if you walk down the street, everyone is wearing that shoe. They're wearing that just to go and get a coffee. They're wearing it right. to go to the supermarket. Um, it's become the shoe of no, like a normal shoe. Mm-hmm. And so we've also seen a massive boom in knee replacements and hip replacements because people are standing on a hill most of the time. I don't know what the correlation is, but it, our body's not meant to be standing on a hill like right. a, as in a slope, a gradient, mm-hmm. and it's not meant to be cushioned. Our body's meant to do that for itself. So right. I think that kind of answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And then to just piggyback on that, yeah, what kind of shoe should we be running in? If not a cushioned shoe, because it makes it really easy to overstride. Like I have run yeah. in my barefoot shoes before yeah. and it is a lot harder and you end up yeah. like a lot more sore. Like yeah. it is, and because, I mean, it's, a very dynamic movement. You have to use balance. You've got all these things going on, right? And so, I mean, the the difference between running in a regular shoe that's like very normal and running in a barefoot shoe is literally night and day. I almost couldn't walk for like yeah. a couple of days. It was like yeah. the amount of stress on my calves. I can't even tell you. <laughs> it was like this whole new range of motion. You know, it's like yeah. I have this all this new movement ability yeah. and range and my body was definitely not ready for it. So what kind of shoe should we be running in? Is it safe to run barefoot? I've seen like really extreme um, versions of this on social media also where yeah. you're running like ma- like marathons barefoot and the yeah. feet just look like cardboard, like just hard stone. I don't know. Yeah. So, get, so yeah, let us know. <laughs> if you think, I don't know how your kids are. Mine are 13 and 15 and they wouldn't have any problem running barefoot. Like they they'd be comfortable running barefoot because oh, they've yeah. only worn a, you know, also, or in a barefoot shoe because that's all they've ever known, you know? Well, my kids actually had a period of time when I was still practicing old podiatry when they were orthotics and all this type of stuff, but mm-hmm. then they changed because I changed. But anyway, um, yeah. but now at 13 and 15, they can run comfortably in barefoot shoes. I am personally been like five years into the process of running barefoot into bare, in barefoot shoes or barefoot. And I'm still getting sore because I'm running in barefoot shoes because mm-hmm. for the first 40 years of my life, right. I didn't, you know? Yeah. So it's all about load management. If you really want to do it, then you probably going to have to change your technique or even the shoe itself changes your technique because it hurts to land on your heel so heavily. Right. And you're probably going to have to look into your technique. You're probably going to have to peel back how much running you're going to, you're doing in, in that shoe. And then you could say, well, I'll just do it once a week and then go back to my other shoes. But then you're just kind of, it's like counterproductive. So um, it, it's like a huge undertaking. And I guess the older you get or the less athletic you've been, then it's harder to do. So then we're luckily, and, and there are a lot of hard flat surfaces around. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even me, like I I mostly trail run because that means every step is a little different, you know, whereas when I'm just running, say on a track or on the road, the steps are are far more similar. And so you get Mm -hmm. more repetitive stress. And so we're luckily now, um, 
we've got some shoes called um, Ultra, A-L-T-R-A, and Topo, T-O-P-O. And they have, um, the Ultra are purely flat, but they're flexible. Like they've got some gifts so your foot can move. Mm -hmm. They're wide at the tip so your foot can splay. And they've mm -hmm. got some cushioning. So if I'm going to do a race, like a 10-kilometer race, I'll put them on because then I don't have to really think about how I'm worried. Like even the idea that I don't even think about my feet um, is a bit foreign to me because like we should be worrying about where we put our foot, you know, but when I put that shoe on, I don't have to worry about where I put my foot because I'm just can hit the ground hard. Right. I'm, I'll now pull up sore for a different reason. Like I might be sore in my knees and my hips because there's a lot of force going up because my foot's not doing its thing anymore. Right. Um, and then there's Topo, which um, this is another brand. And they've got like a five mil drop. So a, a smaller heel. So this kind of eases people into running mm -hmm. in a more minimalist way. And so I think these shoes are really helpful in the market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell. It was not my knees and my hips that I was feeling the pain. And it was like solely my calves. Yeah. So oh if, you're going down, if you're going down to minimalist shoes, it's going to be calves and feet. Yeah. If you're going back to cushioning, like I do when I do that race, then it's going to more likely be hips and knees because a cushion like your foot is the shock absorber for you. That's how it should right. be. Yeah. When you put the cushioning there, your foot doesn't do the shock absorbing so much anymore. And the force goes up into your knees and hips. So when I run yeah. in those cushion shoes, I feel more force in my knees and, mm -hmm. and hips. And this is okay if I get used to it, but because I, I might do it like once a month or something, I don't get used to it. So I get, I get sore. I accept mm -hmm. that I'm sore and go, that's because I ran in those. And then a few yeah. days later, I'm fine again. Hey sister, I'm taking a moment to share about my favorite barefoot shoes brand by Feel Grounds. Our feet are our foundation, and if that foundation isn't strong, it can have a trickle effect up to our knees, hips, and you guessed it, your pelvic floor. Studies show that by simply switching your foot's environment to a barefoot shoe, it can lead to an increase of muscle strength in the feet up to 60% with no additional foot-focused exercises. I love Feel Grounds because they have a thin sole to help you feel the ground, zero drop to reduce knee and hip pain, a wide toe box to foster toe splay, and it's super flexible to enable a full range of motion for your feet. Use the link in the show notes to get your pair of Feel Grounds to improve your foundation. Now, let's get back to the show. You know, it's like, it's like gradually like moving yourself towards yeah. being barefoot yeah. more often. And, you know, I mean, we are barefoot. At like a hundred percent at home and the kids yeah. like barely have shoes on if we go out like the, the littlest one she's barefoot all the time and they literally they we've got like um like train rails outside the wood like the big beams yeah. they walk all over that we've got rocks and they're all over that and it just doesn't even phase them and like sure. yeah and everybody else is like oh my gosh if I walk on that like my feet are yeah. so um like like baby soft you know and like yeah. my kids feet are not baby soft they are rough yeah. they can handle some terrain out there but uh yeah so I guess just like bare, like just moving gradually towards that and just not doing the the the, the quick switch that I did like yeah, going from running about, with those yeah. thick shoes it's to like about load management yeah, yeah. <laughs> load management and I mostly see people that have tried to do things too quickly and so yeah. Um, to, because then they and get then it turns them before. off yeah and then they're like yeah, I don't want right. to do it anymore yeah yeah that's right so it's all about load management and the barefoot movement is about 12 or 13 years old and so when it first came out there's a book called born to run telling everyone they should be running barefoot mm -hmm. and then those vibram five fingers those shoes that had five fingers mm -hmm. and five to, like five toes and um people were running in those they were going from doing 50 mile a week in their nikes to 50 yeah. mile a week in, and they're getting injured and then mm -hmm. um that kind of put a downer on that because it wasn't done sensibly there weren't people like myself and all these other movement people that were helping um people get used to this type of footwear so and yeah. like anything it's a gradual process nothing should really be happening overnight it's just That's you right. know once yeah. one literal step at a time let's talk a little bit about bunions this is like a thing that yeah. people say are genetic is this genetic or can this be reversed is it something that you're just like going to be predisposed to um because of genetics or is it just mostly because what you're putting your feet into um so it's a combination like I, you'll understand that when when people talk to me i'm very gray like it's not black and white social media loves black and white but it's a very gray area um and so um what the way i like to explain it uh, simply uh, there, there are two genetic factors this is a, bit, a, a wider space between the first and second metatarsal so this is the bone leading to the big toe and the next one across um if we took an x-ray of someone that's pre predisposed or genetically predisposed to a bunion there'll be a wider space there and then more mobility in the joint so in in the joint that's affected and in your whole body so we see people that are a bit more flexible more likely to get bunions so they're the genetic components basically put okay there, there are a few others but that makes it more complicated so the so if you don't if you have that foot type and never put it in a shoe you end up with a beautifully splayed foot okay so a big toe that goes straight out and it, we can see this in 
communities that never wear shoes. There's hardly any bunions. There's hardly any heel pain. There's hardly any foot conditions. And so it's the environment you put those genetics into. Checking my feet. I'm looking at my toes right now. I feel like I have a, like a bigger space between my big toe and my like index toe. So maybe, yeah. but that makes sense because I feel like my family has bunions, but it's because they're shoving them into shoes that are too small. Yeah. And so the, the environment <laughs> yeah. you put them in is the shoe, obviously. And so um, when from three years of age, we put um, people, kids into a shoe or, and then for the rest of our lives, that is widest at the base of the toes and then tapers, then that there is your environment to trigger a bunion as well. So you've yeah. got those, let's simply put the genetics of a bunion are that wide space between first and second metatarsal, um, the j- joint mobility and your predisposition to wearing shoes that yeah. push your toes sideways. And so um, this is a, a very big area of contention because nearly all podiatrists say it's nothing to do with shoes, but I can how is it possible that yeah exactly. no. and, and I see the reverse like I have people come to me well my wife's a great example she had like there's four stages of bunion, bunion so she had like stage two with pain and then does no exercises no help for her feet you know nothing that I would suggest to a client or her she's done none of that she just changed the environment of her feet like four years ago and her big toes are straighter now because they have they can be they can be straighter so yeah because there's room um, yeah, yeah, there's room. And so can they be reversed? Well, often we don't see much change in the bony deformation, but we see change in symptoms. We see change in um, like painful symptoms and we see uh, the toes start to straighten out. We see change in function as well, um, just by changing the environment. But then I have, that's my job, I guess. I um, assess people as to whether they're strong in this muscle and we're, and tight in this one and let's loosen this one and let's get this one stronger and let's change the environment and like coming at it from all different aspects because sometimes it's like um, in, in your job, um, some like women have had a cesarean, which is major abdominal surgery, and then they haven't been rehabilitated properly. And so um, if the ground is, is firm, we need, and we can push off that with our foot, we also need... Um, strength and mo- and stability up further in the trunk and mm-hmm. so we see women that have had babies like five years ago oh my bunion suddenly got worse well this is more joint mobility um because of relaxing the hormone that goes through right. and then they've also lost this pelvic floor strength and core strength and so i watch them walk and their hips are like wobbling all over the place and the right. foot is just being, is there, therefore unstable and more likely to get a bunion mm-hmm. and so if we're not addressing further up the chain there as well but it's not for everyone that needs for addressing further up the chain and i don't actually um prescribe those exercises i'll just refer out to a pt or a good pilates studio or a good yoga studio or something that's going to address that side of things as well you know mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so it's like this holistic approach it's definitely. not generally it's not just about changing the shoes and before my wife's feet changed i would have said it's definitely not just about changing the shoes but um, i know that changing the shoes is a massive factor you can do all the exercises until the cows come home, like you'll just be doing exercises and then putting your foot in that squishy shoe, it's counterproductive. They're just balancing each other out, you know? Totally, totally, yeah. Yeah. And um, so so with that said, if we're looking at feet that have bunions or distortions, what types of dysfunctions can we expect up the kinetic chain? Um, And I also, you know, there's like crazy photos going around of like elite athletes that have yeah. the craziest toes that. I've ever <laughs> seen. Yeah, you posted it too. And I like, I love to hear your side of that. Like, mm. so if our feet help us stay stable and they really are a foundation, like what's to say, like, what about these elite athletes that have the most messed up toes I've ever yeah. seen? And they're like elite athletes, like where- The argument that I put up with that picture is it's form versus function. Like um, the form as in the shape, how does that affect function? And these are Usain Bolt and Le- LeBron James have these feet that just look totally mangled. Um, were they like that to start with? I really doubt it. Like they would have been beautiful little kids' feet. No one comes out with bunions, you know, they come out with these yeah. beautiful um, feet. Um, did their did their footwear change their feet like this? Was it because they're just doing highly repetitive one exercise? Like if you think about the way we're meant to move, maybe we're meant to be climbing a tree today, then running 100 to 20 kilometers tomorrow, and then sprinting after our, you know, our prey the next day, and then squatting the next day and sleeping the next day. And these guys are just doing the same activity over and over again. And so I'm not sure how balanced their bodies are in that respect. Um, But they are high level and they've got feet that would seem to be quite looking dysfunctional, but they can't be dysfunctional because they're obviously highly functional. Maybe they'd be even more highly functional if their feet were better. But who knows? Yeah. I, I, who knows the answer to that? Your body is just so resilient and adaptive. It just like, adaptive, if you're exactly. doing the same thing over and yeah. over, it's going to find the, the quickest, fastest, most efficient yeah. way to do that exactly. one thing. Yeah. 
So to ask, me, ask him to do something else, though. You know, yeah. if you want him to do something else, else with his feet, yeah. like his body is not meant to do anything else with those feet, and you're yes. not going to get that toe to move, or you know, yeah, so right. dysfunctional, I guess, is like subjective. It can, like, yeah. exactly, yeah, it's a mute point. So it's then, okay. uh, <laughs> what? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's right. What? So what happens further up the chain? So the knee is a bit of a dumb joint. It's like basically a hinge, and so it's being told what to do by its hip and the foot. And so if we've got ankle joint range of motion issues, or, or foot joint, or you've got a stiff foot then I liken it to a scissor jack that's jacking up a car, you know, like um, it's got joints on either on all those different points. If you mm -hmm. stop one of those joints moving, if you can imagine a car jacking up and you mm -hmm. fuse one of those joints, then all the other joints either have to work more or less right. to keep the car going up straight or the car topples over. And so if our ankle joint's not working so well, then we're going to have more um, a change in load at the knee. If our hip's not working so well, we're going to have a change in load at the knee. Like the joints around you will accommodate the, right. the, and so if we've got a stiff big toe the next joint up the midfoot will move more to accommodate if you've got a stiff midfoot your big toe and your ankle might move more or less to accommodate and so um we can use this to our advantage if someone has a knee pain we should put them in a flatter shoe because as soon as we put them in a, a heel increases knee flexion okay so this is pure biomechanics so when we put a heel on a shoe it increases knee flexion so there's more load at the knee so anyone with a sore knee should go into a flatter shoe because that decreases knee flexion decreases knee load um conversely if someone has an ankle injury maybe we should put them in a heel for a short time to decrease the load to help them settle down but then we should all you shouldn't leave someone in in these situations you should be rehabilitating them you shouldn't right it's like, a band-aid it's a band-aid yeah, at that point the, that's right you shouldn't put them in the sling um and then say okay it's not hurting you're fine off you go yeah just wear them for the like, rest of your life <laughs> like we, there's a growing a common growing pain for children um it, was called Severs disease. We've moved away from calling it Severs disease because it's not a disease and we don't want to label a problem as a disease. It's just a growth plate issue at the back of the heel. And traditionally, podiatry put a heel lift in because that takes the load off this extra tight muscle because when kids are growing. So what I'll do now is I might put a heel lift in for the sport, for the activity, you know, that's triggering the pain because that wow. means they can get through that. But then for day-to-day -day life, I get them in a lower shoe so that their muscle gets longer, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then they're getting the benefit of, day to day, but getting it longer and stronger, but then getting some relief when they're playing sport. But in a year's time, they can go, go, go without that, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, I, I even have family that would have, and even my husband, he um, blew out his knee and he, you know, the football coaches and stuff just put him in a, in a knee brace, you know, and he'd have to, then he was wearing two knee braces. And then it's like, <laughs> You know, but like, is that really if that is that really helping because you're still jamming your foot into this tiny little cleat and just getting the smallest size possible so that it's like so tight and it's like, it's like, do the people that are telling these athletes like what to do even really know what they're talking about because well, you're creating yeah, yeah. all this dysfunction over time like yeah. the knee pain is not even coming from the knee it's that symptom is like coming from somewhere else and we're not yeah. looking there. Yeah, and they're um, by putting a brace on you're creating a need for that brace you know i see people i wear this ankle brace and i've been wearing it for 20 years because if i don't wear it my ankle like this is just in their heads you know or they've right. been wearing orthotic for 20 years mm -hmm. and then i watch them walk i'm like when i watch you walk barefoot i see no need for this orthotic yeah and it's like my, what do you mean there's no like I, your foot's doing what it should do it rolls in then it pushes off you know if you right. do a lot you know and there may be some nuances that if you go and run a marathon you're going to get sore feet and then maybe the orthotic might help in that weird situation you know but generally speaking um like orthotics, braces, like all these different things should only be there for a short term to help someone get through an injury with a view mm -hmm. to getting them out and getting them stronger. Because mm -hmm. our bodies, like you said before, are highly adaptable and they want to be well. Like pain is not our natural state. And so if you give the body the right environment, it will respond and be better. Yeah. Right. I guess it's all like all nuanced, you know, the more I hear you talk about it. But can you have high arches or flat feet or is it just the environment that you've been putting your foot in like yeah you have high arches because you're shoving this like really high arch into your foot all day long or do you you know so like do we have flat feet or do like do people have high arches like my little my 18 month old like you, this was another thing you brought up that triggered this thought too was like um form and function like my 18 month old her foot kind of looks like flat to me and I watch it and it kind of slides in a little bit, but like, she's still growing. She doesn't have all the strength and like, no, we're not going to put her in those thick shoes because to support her ankle, like let's build that strength up naturally and let her walk on all yeah. different types of surfaces and like all these things. Okay. So yeah, I just spit like Perfect. five yeah. questions at so, you. That's right. So, so um, no, I, I, like it's a 
I was going to start with kids anyway. So when we are born, our, leg, our hips are externally rotated. And then as we start growing and start weight bearing, they start internally rotating. And so this is putting our foot in a flatter position, hips internally mm -hmm. rotating. is. And then as we get to like teenagers, they start externally rotating again. Um, but children, especially 18 month old, should should have a flat foot. They, they've got a big fatty pad in the arch that is actually there to help the foot be stable because they need as much they've got this massive head compared to their body True. size it's they so big be, they, they <laughs> need to be as stable as possible and they want as much feedback into their foot as possible so they want as much ground contact on the ground as possible and so light bulb we, moment light bulb we, moment if we saw a foot with an arch at 18 months old i'd be like oh that's a bit of concern there might be some overly muscle tight muscles or something and at that age their foot is basically cartilage there's hardly any bone you know it's just this wobbly um <laughs> floppy thing that just conforms to everything <laughs> And so it's meant to be like that. And then if there's going to be an arch, it's around six to eight years of age, we start seeing because the hips are starting to externally rotate again and bring those arches up and the foot and the, the bones are becoming harder. The muscles are getting firmer. And then if you, like we all have a natural arch, like I might have a big nose, you might have a small nose. Um, when someone might have a high arch or a low arch, it's just the way our bodies are. Some might have no arch. Some of our most highly functional feet are really flat. Some are really high arched. It doesn't really matter. It's about how well they move. And so... Um, like mm -hmm. for children's sake, I see a lot of people come in with their kids like internally rotated and their arches down. I'm like, they're freaking out about their kids' yeah. um, feet. And I'm like, that's just maybe the way they're going to be or it's just part of their development. Expose that child to as much varied play as possible. Get your hips externally rotating. So climbing, martial arts, yoga, mm -hmm. dancing, gymnastics, anything that is like all this variable movement and a lot of play because you know kids are active when they go to sport once a week and then training once a week i'm like that's not active a child should be active like six to eight hours a day yeah and exposing their body to all these different movements and then it doesn't matter what it looks like and then as we become adults like obviously i see some people with high arches low arches it doesn't matter it's not about that and this is where language is important i have these conversations with people i'm like okay what have people what have you what do you think about your own feet oh i've got flat feet oh i've got rolled in arches i pronate i'm like well um so i want to hear what they've been told because yeah um it's more like I want to create a positive environment about their body. It's like saying, oh, I've got fat thighs, you know, like, well, you don't actually just got strong thighs and yeah. that's you just get to you and, and work with it and be you, you know, like, so it's a, this a slightly body positive view of feet because yeah. um, you can, you can go, oh, I want a high arch, but your foot's never going to have a high arch, but it's a highly functional foot. So just embrace it and yeah. accept and know that it's really good at, at the, um, at the rolling in part, but need, maybe in, if you're going to do some exercises, it's going to be help. You, you, it's going to be the ones that help you push off better. You know, like we're not all perfect. We can always do some work on ourselves, but it's totally. about finding where you're at. As a yeah. does that kind of answer the question? There's not a yeah. right or wrong. Right. Totally, and I think that like it, off the top of my head, I imagine maybe ten years ago, those um like I see I'm seeing them at least here in the states in like the uh those like quick shops or whatever where you can go and stand on that yeah. surface and it tells you like what oh, your foot is yeah yeah and then they just they're just trying to sell you something to put yeah. in your shoe you yeah. know like oh my god i had no idea that i had this problem yeah. i need that thing to go yeah. in my shoe because i have flat foot and or i have yeah. a really yeah. high arch and yeah it's like actually like you just said like somebody has a big nose somebody has a small nose comparatively like it's just all we're all different we all have yes. different physiology anatomy, and yeah, yeah. yeah anatomy and bony structures and um gosh that's such a it, it's just like seeing what people's like beliefs are about their yeah. own feet like what they've been yeah. told and like the language that they pick up and like so deeply attached to you yeah. know I have a flat foot then I'm rolling yeah. in so I need all this support and I'm not I can't be a runner or you know all yeah. these things and I, I would say it starts from when they're like 18 months old when grandma yeah. says hey look at look at your little girl she's her yes. feet are rolling in mm -hmm. and and then grandma and the 18 month old's not hearing it then but then like they're you oh look her feet are still rolling you know this is this is this um talk that happens about all different parts of our body you know right um, you know yes. like even even with our um our sons, oh, look how strong and, and athletic he is. And our daughters, oh, look how pretty you are. You know, like it's, oh, then yeah. it's attaching some some relevance to this, you know, that, that's yeah. not important. You know? Right. Yeah. And it, yeah. yeah, and the same could be like like those type of comments and then also like the negative comments. You just like yeah. hang on to these things because they've been told yeah. about your yeah. body and it's yeah. it just isn't those things. It just yeah. is what it is. Like you just yeah, are who right. you are. Let's talk about um, lifters, weightlifters. I see all types of weightlifters or just athletes in general on social media, swearing by the Converse shoes, like the, the flat, like you were mentioning right. flat, I guess, I don't know the, the Converse that I have, were not that flexible. They kind of have like a thick okay. yeah. bottom. 
um, compared to barefoot shoes that I have now, I have feel grounds and they're very flexible. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about the Converse shoes. They're like very popular um, in lifting and CrossFit and all those things. How good can they be for our foot, especially when lifting heavy loads, if we're not able to get a good toe splay or tripod foot when you're shoving into that narrow toe box? Yeah, so um, you'll see people in the gym in Converse. The biggest issue with that, there's a small heel that I don't think that's a negotiable, that's okay. It's so small. Um, they're a bit cushioned, but still, again, you can still feel the ground, but the squishing of the toes, they are definitely squished toes. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to be able to splay our toes. Our toes aren't meant to be squished. And um, it kind of blows me away that this is not a given in our in society that like, it's just a given, it is a given that we're squishing our toes. So, and, and then lifter, um, then, then there's like, um, when someone's squatting, they might use those shoes that have got a big heel on them. And this does, um, it's anatomically stronger position to be lifting from, like it loads the quads more and so more balanced. And so they can lift more. And so it's like, um, if you're a runner, you might, like me, I might run in barefoot shoes most of the time, but when I want to perform, and not think about it, I might put my cush, slightly cushioned shoe on. Mm -hmm. And so, and I might train in that occasionally, so I'm kind of used to it. Um, and so that's what, where those shoes are useful, similar to climbing as well, like oh, a yeah. shoe that is squashing your toes, but it's helpful for the activity, you know? And so- Yeah, those climbing so, shoes, they are so tight. Those are like a ballet yeah. slipper, those things. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So um, there are very some shoes and they're, they're some of them, but the converse, uh, there's no excuse for them. Like there's now so many options in terms of barefoot shoes that are ticking the boxes in terms of making you use the ground and feel um, that uh, converse aren't helpful in the gym, I think. Like they're probably more helpful than if you're wearing your Nikes that are you know, wobbling all over the place. Right, but, yeah. You know, there's a, a scale, yeah. Yeah, so I guess because there's, so the better option got, would be shifting from converse to just a regular barefoot shoe because they're both yes. fairly flat but you're yeah. able to feel the ground more and yeah. you're um, benefiting from that proprioceptive feedback by being able to have your toes kind of spread versus yeah. being shoved and that, um, you know, not having that toe splay can affect well, balance to, and core strength. And yeah. If you're meant to brace your foot, if your toes are squished, it's very hard to brace your foot. It's like saying you're trying to flex your, flex your arm, but your arm's stuck in this position. It's very hard to flex it. You yeah. know? So if we're trying to use our feet in our lifting, then we need to be able to actually move our toes. Um, and this is the benefit of a barefoot shoe, which is they're thin, they're flat and flexible, and they're wide. And they're all the same in terms of providing those um, those attributes to their shoe. So yeah, I've got a shoe that I could wear to a funeral or a wedding, like with a suit, but I could also go and run a marathon in that shoe. And I could also go to the gym and lift in that shoe because it's just, they're all, it's, it's doing the same thing as the shoe that looks like the one I'd wear to the gym or looks like the one I'd go for a run in. I could go for, a, I could run a marathon in the, in a sandal. that's just a piece of rubber. Um, but I could also just go to the beach in it. So the, the point of this type of shoe is it just lets your foot be a foot. You don't have to um, have a special <laughs> one, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, whether your body, it's whether your body is equipped to do it rather than whether you need the special shoe for it. You know? yeah. yeah. Can you, uh, do you have any thoughts on um, like flip-flops? Yeah. So generally I do have a lot of thoughts on them. Um, you generally <laughs> have to hold them on in the, in the lifting phase. Like they're good because they're flat, they're flexible and um, they're not that thin, but as your foot comes through, your toes have to claw to hold them on. And this is not a normal action of your toes. And yeah. so it creates, it, it create, can create imbalances. Like we see people with claw toes and things like that. Um, and then there's some that have got arch support. Well, that's a, like, the biggest load of rubbish I've ever seen. Like, oh, you need arch support in your thongs. Like, if you're going to wear them, fine. Wear your thongs when you get out of the car to walk to the beach across the hot road, you know? Like, fair right. enough. Or when mm -hmm. you go to the pool and you don't want to get some fungus from the showers or something. Um, you know, wear them then, but don't wear them for long periods of time. And you definitely do not need arch support in your thongs. <laughs> okay, interesting. I feel like I've got family. They're wearing those thongs. They're wearing them with the arch support and they're wearing them all day long. Like, and you're literally just gripping your yeah, toes yeah, all day long. Yeah, Crocs are another interesting one. You know, Crocs, they're like yeah, a really yeah. wide shoe. They're mm -hmm. wide, they're flat, they're pretty flexible. And they you can you can have a strap on the back that holds you in uh -huh. and then you don't have to claw. But most people are too lazy to put the strap on the back. So they just have it at the front and then they're still clawing. So I don't mind them if they've got the strap on the back. Yeah. Okay, so Crocs <laughs> are okay. We're in the okay zone if we yeah. wear the strap on the back. But don't there's be lazy a lot of people. Yeah, there's the a lot of cushioning in them. There's a lot oh, of cushioning Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah. yeah. There is yeah. a lot of cushioning. <laughs> So if we're going to start going barefoot and you've been wearing orthotics or extremely cushioned shoes, how much time should we be starting off being barefoot? 
Um, so if you, it depends on if you're barefoot at home, like some people that habitually barefoot at home and they've just had three years of lockdown, two, two years of lockdown, and mm-hmm. they've been barefoot the whole time. And they come to me and like, oh, I'm struggling with my shoes going back into, going to, back to work and stuff. I'm like, well, what have you been doing for the last two years? Oh, I've been barefoot at home. I'm like, so you haven't worn your orthotic for two years? Okay, so it's going to be a very easy transition. Other people get up because they've been told to, and they, the first thing they do is put their shoes and their orthotics on and they are in them until they go to bed, you know, oh, unless yeah. they have mm-hmm. And so that's going to be a lot longer um, process. So it's just meeting people where they're at and just doing any change very gradually. Okay. And then I guess, see, I do all my workouts barefoot and they're all like mm-hmm. when I um, record and shoot content, it's always barefoot. So um, it's always at home too. It's not like gym workouts or anything mm. really crazy where you mean you don't, necessarily i guess want to be barefoot walking around the gym but um yeah, i would like i definitely do and it's fine like your foot is highly resilient i see some people have a whole lot of fungus on one foot and not the other because they've got a different blood supply to that foot they've got you know um there might be more sweat glands so this idea that we catch all this stuff is just like it's like oh, if yeah. you're resilient you don't really catch stuff and the idea that dropping a, pl- a weight plate on your foot is going to be protected by your nikes is like a crock of you know like right. it doesn't really make any difference if you drop 20 kilos or 40 pounds on your foot if you've got yeah. your nikes on or not right <laughs> totally yeah. yeah um so i guess i mean I, when i go to the gym i do wear those barefoot shoes but do you have like a list of like favorite barefoot shoes like um for adults and i don't know if you have many kid brands or maybe they should just yeah. be barefoot <laughs> yeah um so there's 140 barefoot shoe brands in the world so wow. Yeah, it's a booming industry. Um, the best, and so there are some that are really good shape for this type of foot, and there's some that are really good shape for that type of foot. And mm. so it really depends on your foot shape. So there's a, um, a lovely person named Anya, um, Anya Jensen. She's um, got a website, Anya's Reviews, and this is where you go on there, and there's like 10 foot shapes, and you go, oh, that's my foot shape. And then you click on that one, and then it just lists all the different shoe brands that are I think best. I for follow them. her. I think yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that's and, a and, great and resource. Then, and children's, like a lot of children's shoes are barefoot anyway without even realizing it. But mm-hmm. then um, her website is also the best resource for that as well. Um, like I could reel off 10 off my head, off the top of my head, but you're better off just going there and seeing where they're easily available and that type of thing. I don't want to miss out on any, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll put, I'll, I will put her yeah, website she, she's in the like show notes. A, that's the best place to go and check for which, where to get the shoes and what type of shoes we're talking about. Like she pretty much nails it and she is now, like we all started out really black and white, um, like you must be this, but now she's coming to realise with time like me, it's a very grey area. And so a lot of the barefoot barefoot um, exponents on social media, like you must do this, you must do this. But it's far, it's like we're human. Let's just be, let's let our bodies adapt and let's be gentle. And she's, she has that perspective, so it's good. Yeah, I love uh, just that concept because it really can apply to everything. It's like there's no yeah. black and white with literally any field or niche it's like all gray because we're all human we all have yeah. uniqueness that just needs to be shown compassion instead of being like you yeah. need to go barefoot 100 percent of the time like not everybody can or like wants to yeah. or whatever what are some of your favorite foot or toe foot and toe mobility exercises or drills um that everybody can really benefit from that we should be doing um i yeah. guess to just just like improve function improve mobility range of motion decrease stiffness all that kind of stuff yeah I'm, I'm really a lot about habitual change like I love the idea of changing things by habit and so I give foot exercises all the time mobility exercises the best um, exercise is one that happens without you having to do your exercises so this is um, just wear just being barefoot or wearing shoes that make your feet work like there's some really good research that shows that the foot muscles got 60 percent bigger over a six-month period from people that stayed in their ASICs compared to those that changed to a minimal shoe 60 percent bigger that's a massive change in six months no exercises just wearing a barefoot shoe mm-hmm. and so um, what I find astonishing about that is that's that they had the ability to get 60% bigger because they were so small to start with from wearing the other shoes, you know, yeah. and like if you look at it from that perspective, but that said, everyone loves to know what exercises to do. Like when I'm in clinic, I'm assessing whether they need an ankle range, an ankle mobility or a midfoot mobility or a big toe mobility exercise. Mm-hmm. But generally mobility exercises are good, like rolling a ball on the sole of your foot, like a stiff rubber ball to mm-hmm. try and open up those joints. If you can imagine you've got 33 joints in your foot and most of them are kept quite stiff because of shoes. So if we get them moving, that's helpful. That increases 
blood supply, it moves the muscles around, it gets some um, movement happening. Um, generally speaking, I, I get people balancing or practicing their balance. Um, every step when we're walking is single leg balance. So we yeah. um, balance and then step to the next foot and we're balancing again, step to the next foot, we're balancing again. So practicing balance. So um, using a ball, practicing balance, calf raises, tend to, people tend to be less efficient at pushing off. So I get a lot of people doing calf raises and also getting them just to move their toes. If mm-hmm. like If you can't send a message from your brain to your big toe to move separately to your other toes and then splay your other toes and then spread your toes um this is a bit of an issue if i wanted to strengthen my bicep and i um couldn't move my arm it would be very hard so we need to yes. be able to move our feet so we can strengthen them so sometimes often step one is just getting your feet moved mind muscle connection you can't you can't access yeah. a muscle that you don't have mind muscle connection to it's really hard yeah. to work that muscle or strengthen it what do you think about those um those little web the little web thing that goes on your toes you know um, so those then, are like very popular yeah, all over the place yeah, right now yeah so toe spaces they're yeah. a helpful adjunct they're helpful if someone has like a, a lot of squishing going on and they're going to change their shoes mm-hmm. if you're in them for two or three hours a day a night but then back into the shoe you're just like back forward back forward back forward so you're better better off changing your shoes so i often okay. prescribe them um, but not always it depends on the situation yeah like yeah. if you think that's what looking after your feet is then that's not what looking after your feet is that's like a little tick a little tick in the box without looking at the bigger picture yeah right so like main takeaways is like get into a wide toe box and start using it gradually it's like the only long-term thing you know you can't just yeah. you can't wear those toe spacers and then put your foot back in yeah. a nike so um so wide toe box practice your balance barefoot i assume yeah with your definitely. eyes closed um, that makes a, it harder next step, yeah. <laughs> next step close your eyes um yeah and then that mind muscle connection that's great yeah like your audience i guess is new mums or mums to be and this is when their body's going through a huge amount of change and you don't want to make these changes as well too quickly and mm-hmm. so the birkenstock can be quite com- quite a good shoe because it's got some support i'm usually against support but when you've had support your whole life and then you're suddenly carrying extra weight and you're using a, having a hormone through your body that softens things out we do want to um still like don't take too much away but a Birkenstock generally has some gentle support the toes can splay you know so that can be a quite a good nice option for is that the double strap the double Um, strap even better with a strap on the back okay we need the strap on the back I have the Birkenstocks with the double strap but no strap in the back And, and so not many people do but again you're more likely to be clawing if you're don't have the strap on the back but it yeah you know, what's so crazy is I have those, uh, the feel grounds. I have one pair yes. and I literally yeah. cannot wear any other closed toe shoe. I cannot yeah. get, it's just not comfortable anymore. My yeah. foot. And I always thought like growing up too, my husband told me a long time ago, he's like, you should get a wide shoe. I'm like, I do not have a wide foot. I will not get the wide foot. And now I'm like all about the barefoot shoe and the wide toe box because it was like this weird thing that I had in my head, like this language, right? This language Ultra. around yeah. a wide foot, like ew like I have a wide foot like no I want us to be proud of our wide feet (laughs) yeah now I'm like the wider the better (laughs) like let's get all those toes moving and separated um yeah yeah, but that like on that note about the pregnancy population you know you have that relaxing going through your body and I think a lot of women feel like their feet get bigger during pregnancy and that's really why you know and also um posture changes you're shoving the femur forward and the hip socket a little bit and kind of leaning back when you have that big belly in front of you and so (laughs) everything kind of like flattens out and spreads out, but also could be a great opportunity to start wearing bare, barefoot feet. I would think like postpartum, your feet are already bigger. Like let's yeah. take up that space. Andy, that, yeah, that was so much good information. Uh, some great uh, starting out tips for people that want to start going barefoot and um, touch on a couple of things like the knee braces and how those are like band-aids and the crazy toes from the elite players in um, in basketball. So all the good stuff. And you're also sitting on the floor. That's yeah. so like natural of you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy. Yeah. yeah. Um, where can people find you on the internet? And um, is there any offerings that you have that people can access your help or just, just shout yourself out right here? So uh, on Instagram, I'm Andy Bryan underscore podiatrist. And um, you can find me there. And I do do online consultations, but I also am in a network of other podiatrists similar to this. And I think it's better to find someone nearby so I can help you with that. Um, I'm also at Melbourne Natural Podiatry. That's my website. Um, there's not a lot of information on my website, but enough to get in contact with me if people need to. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. And um, I love talking about feet and that you were... <laughs> a wealth of knowledge. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. 
What a fun episode. I loved learning about everything that Andy was talking about from bunions and children's feet and how we can start step-by-step -step implementing more barefoot practices into our life. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe and follow and share it on social media with a friend. Make sure to tag me if you do. With that said, I will see you in the next show or in our next workout. Love you guys so much and I'll see you soon.